Hey everybody, Mr. Musak here again with another video lecture for Soft Prairie's World History. Uh, today's topic is going to be the Industrial Revolution, era that happens in the 19th century, that would be the 1800s. So just out of curiosity, what exactly is the Industrial Revolution? Well, very, very simply, it's a shift. A shift from the economy being based on agriculture, like up here, nothing runs like a deer, to an economy based on manufacturing. Now, we saw the first big shift this way from hunting and gathering to agriculture during the Neolithic Revolution a long, 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 long time ago. This revolution, okay, going from an agriculture-based economy to a manufacturing-based economy happens relatively recently. We're talking within the last 200 years. So this is a very, very new idea of having our entire, air our entire economy excuse me, based off of manufacturing, making stuff, buying stuff, building stuff. The question is, why does this happen, and why does it happen in Europe? Now, first off, the reason we switch from air culture is there's big time shifts in air culture at this time. Uh, big shifts in the late 18th century, the 1700s, early, early 19th century, the 1800s. First off, we have better tools. Up here, a little picture up here, you just uh, squint in real close. New tools of air culture, things like better plows, better harvesting equipment. Uh, there are some called a seed drill made by a guy named Jethro Tull uh, that allows air culture to work better. You can make more food, make it faster. Okay. The other thing is a four-field rotation, a way that we can uh, rotate our fields and get fields uh, nutrients back in fields a lot better. We have wheat and barley in, in two fields, turnips in one, helps to supply food. You leave one field fallow with clover, and a better way to rotate fields so that everybody can make more food. The other thing, so look over here, are the new crops coming up from the new world. Things like potatoes, um, maize, what we here call corn. All these kind of goods are very easy to grow. They grow well in European soils and can provide a lot more food for people. Now, the question is, where does this whole idea begin? And it begins in Britain. The whole reason we shift from air culture to industrialization uh, happens because of something called the enclosure movement. Now, here's a little picture here. Originally, this whole area would be open for people to farm on. People from the village would go out, claim a little piece of land, farm on it together, and that would be how they do their farming. The enclosure movement was when people started fencing off pieces of land. Instead of saying, instead of being good for the common good, this piece of land is mine. And so it came down to enclosing off the land. And then that way, a lot of people that were previous farmers that are now unemployed. So that gives you a very, very big workforce that has to move now. These people used to farm common lands on the countryside that were shared by everybody are now moving to cities saying, hey, I need a job. How can I find some bigger stuff out? Now, certain people have a lot of capital. Capital meaning the idea that you have money to invest in something. You have money to make money. And people who take the capital and risk it and try to invest it are entrepreneurs. Uh, these entrepreneurs kind of follow that laissez-faire idea from Adam Smith. Basically he said, how can I take my money and use it to the best of my ability to better me? And so some of these people decided to use new inventions, new, use new ideas, and they made factories and started making these industrial ideas. The other thing in Britain we have are natural resources. Now, here's a picture over here shows all the coal fields uh, in Britain. Coal is a huge part of this whole idea here, and with coal they can fuel engines, those kind of things, other natural resources, uh, cotton from India and, and e Egypt, uh, different natural resources to make stuff uh, to uh, be sold from factories. And lastly, there is a marketplace. When you make something, you have, to, you have to have a way to sell it to somebody. England had a big empire. They had gained lots and lots of land in other areas, parts of uh, the Americas yet, in India, in Asia, so on and so forth and the greater area of Europe, they have a marketplace they can sell stuff at. And so that's why industrialization, a shift to factory work, starts in Britain. Now the first ever uh, area, industry, to do this stuff was in the cotton industry. Uh, in the cotton industry, the old way to do it was through what's called the cottage industry. Now I'll kind of forward a picture here. You can see a picture here on your left. Uh, the cottage industry was basically you would take raw cotton coming in from, say, the United States or Egypt or wherever, and it would pass from person to person. So one farmhouse, uh, when that woman in that farmhouse would work, they would spin that, that cotton into thread. They'd take that thread onto another place, and people would weave it in a cloth. Another place, they would dye it certain color. Each place along the line was a different step in the, in the production process. And each person got paid a little bit for that amount. Now we shift now to the new way, in the factory, using new kinds of equipment out here. Okay? So this one right here, this is a power loom. Uh, a way that uh, a, a, a called flying shuttle, an easier way to make uh, cloth for that thread. Over here is something called a spinning jenny, a machine that automatically spins cloth, uh, spins uh, fiber, excuse me, into thread. 
a vent, you can take the whole thing here and you put it all together into what's called a water-powered loom. And so eventually we have what's called a water-powered loom here eventually. And so now you can take the whole thing, okay? You have spinning, you have weaving, you power all with a big water wheel and a big factory like this and run the whole thing in one spot. And makes the process much more efficient, much quicker, much easier than passing it from person to person to person to person to person and doing it by hand. Uh, and that's a big part there. Now what makes this process even better is steam engine. Now a guy named James Watt, we have presentations on, these, on this guy in class, to the steam engine. Steam engine was an old technology, but he made it better. He improved it so it was more reliable, uh, easier to use, and uh, used this technology to power factories. Basically a steam engine is just a piston here that moves by way of steam. Steam is introduced. It slides the piston back and forth. That piston then powers a flywheel. That flywheel in turn uh, turns a bunch of belts and each of those belts then will turn a machine like you see here in this uh, in this uh, image right down here. Uh, and each of these machines is turned by this belt running off of one engine and that's it. And so it's a really efficient way to run the whole plate off of one engine. Now if one of these belts were made of leather would break, you could literally knock a person out, knock them unconscious, break arms, even have stories of them taking off limbs, that kind of thing. It's a very, very dangerous system. You get something caught in these things, you can rip limbs off, that kind of stuff. But it was the way they, they ran the factories. The biggest reason for this was that you didn't need to use a water wheel anymore. So now you can put your factory anywhere you wanted to. You run the factory off of the steam engine. You can build it in the middle of a field anywhere instead of having to be by a water source. Uh, coal and iron is the other big thing. If you need more and more machines, you need better iron, better uh, strong materials. Now coal, of course, is needed to power the engines. Okay, But coal is also needed to make better iron. Uh, iron is a very, very brittle uh, metal sometimes because it has a lot of impurities in it. And a new process called puddling made it so that you could have a better form of iron. So you put iron inside this furnace here, heat it up really, really hot, and introduce something to it called coke. Coke is a special type of coal uh, that was made, and it would help burn off all those impurities in the iron. And this iron was a better source of iron. It would bend more. It would not break. It would uh, have a lot, more, a lot better process to it and be a very, very strong metal until the invent of steel in the late 19th century. And so you could build better equipment with this new type of iron. Now, factories during this time was terrible. You see some pictures here, different areas of the factory, all spinning factories. Um, these owners wanted to make as much money as they could. And so they ran their factories on shift work. Uh, these shifts might run all day, every day. They have different groups come in and take over. So your shift might be anywhere from 12, at this time in history, from 12 to 16 hours. A lot of times you would run a day shift, night shift, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. You might run 16 hour shifts. Here's some overlap in the middle. A lot different than today's traditional eight hour shift that people work today. Discipline of these places was very, very harsh. You signed a contract when you started there, and essentially you had to abide by a certain number of rules. Whenever, every time you broke a rule or screwed something up, you had to pay a fine or do an infraction. So if you were late for work, you might pay a, a, a half your day's wages as being for being late to work. If you mess up something you're making, you may pay half your, pay, pay a certain amount of wages to uh, fix those damages. If you get in a fight at work, you might lose your job right away. Those kind of things. Um, sometimes there's even physical punishment as well. People were beaten with sticks and whips, that kind of stuff. And everything we see here is child labor. Now look at these two bound pictures. You these little kids here on these uh, uh, spinning jennies, these uh, uh, spinning machines. They do little kids because one, they're cheap. You don't pay them very much. And two, they get fit in these little places. And one thing they have kids do was pick up lint. As they're making the thread here, they have kids crawl under these machines here and sweep up all little pieces of lint and then put it back into more thread. And so factory life was very, very hot, very, very dangerous, very, very dirty, um, and you didn't get paid a lot for it. It was a very, very rough life working in the factory. So we'll look at this more uh, in class. Uh, that's little slide you guys are going to go through real quick here. A railroad played a big difference too. It's actually the first locomotive up here called the Rocket in 1829, the first modern locomotive. But basically by using steam power and, a, and running a, a vehicle on rails, you move a lot of goods and, a lot of goods and stuff between cities very, very easily. So the locomotive, locomotive like this could move stuff, a 50-ton train, at about 10 miles an hour pretty easily. That's a lot different than using a wagon and those kind of things. Um, the first locomotive we have is running between Manchester and Liverpool over here in uh, western England. It's in 18, 1829, and by 1850, this is what England looks like in terms of railroad tracks. Basically, it's a good way of running infrastructure. You get all the raw goods to the factories, and vice versa, you get the finished product out to the stores and everywhere else. A really easy way to move people and move uh, move uh, goods and services as well. Now, the question is, what's the impact of industrialization? Well, first off, you see a big population growth at this time. 
uh, growth this time. Uh, less plague, less illness a little bit. Uh, and you see population actually grow during this time in terms of versus uh, shrink. Um, there are a few things that do kind of keep population the same. Migration, a lot of people leave, uh, leave Europe, they go to the US, US, other places, so on and so forth. The Irish potato famine kills, or makes a lot of people move, but overall population is growing. In fact, in uh, 1799, came Thomas Malthus wrote a theory about how eventually people would run out of food. He was wrong because because people made so much more food in the agricultural advances, uh, we didn't starve. We didn't starve ourselves or fight over food and kill ourselves all off like Thomas Malthus thought. We'll talk about him in class a little bit more this week as well. Then we came with urbanization. Cities grew even more as people came to the factories. Now here you can tell um, you know, how cramped some of these uh, how cramped some of these cities looked here. How dirty all the smoke, all the haze, all the fog, all those kind of things. Uh, by 1850, about half of the European population, even Western Europe, lived in cities. Uh, people lived in very, very poor conditions, brought in three, four families to a house sometimes. Uh, a lot of people sharing rooms, uh, very, very dirty, very, very poor areas. And over time, they try to get some reforms made. Oops, they want to do that. Some reforms made. Uh, so over time, different reforms were made about health care, about sanitation, sewer systems were installed. Uh, work hours were changed, child labor laws were invented, those kind of things uh, to make things better. But overall, cities were pretty, a pretty tough place to live in the early 19th century, early 1800s. Um, it was really, really uh, urbanization was kind of a good thing, kind of not so good thing too in a way, because it kind of brought more problems to Europe in some cases also. Uh, now the other thing we, we, we see is a class change. Essentially, we get a middle class and we get a working class. Uh, middle class would be that former bourgeois. You become the burgers, kind of the merchant kind of people. Well, now they've become kind of the industry leaders, the industry owners, factory owners, bankers, professionals like doctors and lawyers, those kind of things. And basically, it's these guys that they own the machines, they own the factories. They're ones that put the money up, they're the entrepreneurs. But they put that money up to build the factory, build the technology, build the equipment. And their whole job as a middle class is just to make money. Their job is to take the money, invest it, and any way they can, make money off that money. Now, at the same time, we have a very, very few number of these guys and a lot of people then in the working class. Now, if you're the working class, means you're working in the factory. There you're working six days a week, you have Sundays off for church, you're working 12 to 16 hours a day. In the mines and the mills, it's very, very dangerous. I mean, collapses, explosions, losing limbs and machinery, those kind of things were all big dangers. And if you got hurt, you lost your job. There was no such thing as workman's comp at this time. And so if you got hurt, injured, sick, etc., you're done. Fire you, find something different. Child labor was hugely in use at this time because they were cheaper and easier to control. Um, and until 1833, you saw a lot of child labor happening in Britain. Uh, also, women worked in a lot of factories in the early 19th century as well until different reforms happened. Um, women were paid half what men were. And so that means women were hired in factories over men. And until you know, child labor ended, you know, women were just as much in the factories as men were. Now, with this, we also see some gender role shifts as well. By 1850s, after child labor is, uh, is abolished, and uh, so hours are cut back, and we have a 10-hour workday at this point. Uh, we kind of see this gender role develop in Europe, where women are supposed to stay home, take care of their kids, that kind of stuff, cook clean, etc., do house kind of bound jobs. The guys go and earn money, and so we kind of see this gender role shift happen during this time because of that. That's because of the reforms that took place during that time. Before this, women worked in the factories as much as men were. They had to. They had to work as much that much to pay the bills, and so we kind of see a gender role shift this way too. Uh, as uh, industrialization goes on. And to review guys real quick, what the industrial, industrial revolution is, and the change to a factory-based uh, economy. We know why it happens in terms of kind of the change from agriculture, the new agricultural goods, the enclosure movement. Uh, we know how it happens with the factory development and technology. And also we look at the impact. We'll go over those in class this week, guys. Thank you very much for watching. These are due Wednesday, 326. Make sure they're done for me.